So I'm Brian Snow, I'm the SP Customer Advocate, and there's two things I want you to take away from this presentation today. And the very first thing that I want you to remember is that the programs and strategic systems programs is plural. So that's something that I hope everyone remembers, and I think it's my job to inform you. So why is it plural? Because these are the six lines of business that SP has. You can read about those on their public-facing website. But we often get that wrong when we present to SSP, and I think it's important, one of our best and most important customers, to get their name right when we spell it out. So programs is plural. Next chart. So lesson number two, surround yourself with passion and positivity and anything is possible. So I'm going to talk to you about my journey. And I think the theme in my journey is I've often found myself in jobs and situations that I was in way over my head and I was not qualified for. And so how do you deal with those situations? In fact, how do you, how do you reach out and seek those opportunities is hopefully going to be a takeaway from this presentation. And remember to say thank you. If that's the one thing I can impart to you today, other than programs is plural, remember to say thank you. Next chart. So I was born and raised in San Diego. I think that was me when I was two, and that was me when I was five. I was outside a lot. I enjoyed playing soccer. Next chart. Patrick Henry High School. So there was me as a freshman playing football, and there was me as a senior. So I went to Catholic school through eighth grade, and then I went to public school for high school, and I wanted to play football. So I show up two weeks before school started. I didn't know anybody. Didn't know how to put on shoulder pads, because I'd never played tackle football in my life. And I go down the field, and we run a few drills, and the coach decides that he wants to play me at outside linebacker, which I was not qualified to do. Happy to do, but I didn't know how to tackle, so I made a pretty poor linebacker. So a few days went by, and I got beat up pretty bad trying to learn how to tackle. And he grabbed me, and he brought me down to the varsity field. And he lined me up 10 yards across from an individual named Ricky Williams, who went on to win the Heisman Trophy, <laughs> went on to play professional football for the Dolphins and a few other teams. And he was benching going into his senior year 350. He was a superior athlete by every stretch of the imagination. And so we lined up 10 yards across, and he blew the whistle, and Ricky ran over me like a freight train. And so the coach picked me up, and he lined me up 20 yards away from Ricky, and he told me to stay low and wrap up. And my knees were wobbling. I said, Coach? <laughs> this is a bad idea. <laughs> Brian, stay low and wrap up. So he blew the whistle, and I ran as fast as I could. I stay low and wrap up, and I was on my back seeing stars, and Ricky kept on running. And so that coach picked me up, and he shook me by the shoulder pads, and he said, Snow, no one will ever hit you that hard for the rest of your life. Now you get up there to the JV field, and you show those running backs how you can hit. And I said, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be a linebacker, <laughs> but I did, and I stuck with it, and it was a lot of fun. The next chart. So when I was a junior, it was mandatory to take an aptitude test in the high school, and so you go to a career counselor, and they give you the results of your aptitude test, and my career counselor behind her desk had a poster of CU Boulder and the Flatirons, and she asked me what I wanted to do with my life, and I said, I don't know, where is that? And she said, well, that is the University of Colorado Boulder. And I said, I want to go there. <laughs> and so I did. And when I got there, I did a lot of snowboarding. And I decided that I was going to go study electrical and computer engineering. And it was pretty obvious to me, as soon as I got to my first C++ class, that I was not qualified to be in that course. Because <laughs> these are people that want to be computer programmers for their professional life. And they have been coding for four plus years. And they know C++. They know many program languages, and I didn't know anything about it. So I sat next to the smartest guy in the class, and he lived down the hall from me in the dorm, and I made it my job in life to be good friends with him. And he helped me write my first program, and he basically was my mentor through college. And I survived, and I made it through these computer science programs, decided I didn't want to write code for my life, but that's okay. There was a elderly woman, I say elderly, she was in her 60s, and she was in my computer languages course. So computer languages, you have two weeks to write a program, and every two weeks it's a new program and a new programming language. And so it was a lot of time in the lab learning that program language. If you were like me and you didn't know it already, and, and this lady was there with me 
late nights and one night I went up to her and said, hey, just want to introduce myself. We're here a lot late. I'm struggling with this. Hope you're not struggling as much as I am. But I was just curious what your plans are with this course and how you're going to use it in your life. And she says, well, I'm actually paid by the university to audit courses. So that's what I do. I attend courses and I, I audit them and I provide the deed and School of Engineering reports on how the course is going. And I said, wow, that's amazing. So do you have any program experience? And she says, no, I don't. I said, so I'll tell you, that's truly inspiring because this course is hard and I'm struggling and I intend to use this at some point in my life. And you're here putting in the same amount of time that I am. And I got to tell you, I'm impressed by what you're doing. And she says, oh, honey, I've been doing this for years. <laughs> And I've passed so many courses, I'm not going to stop now. And that just stuck with me. She was determined to get through this course. She was determined to pass the course. Not that she needed to, not that necessarily it was a job, but she knew she could do it. And she was putting in the hours and she was willing to do it. When I was a freshman, I got involved with the hiking club. And the CU Hiking Club is the oldest student organization on campus. And they do backpacking trips. And they took me out for my first backpacking trip. And they took me out to Moab for my first mountain biking trip. And we went on this porcupine rim trail. It was a five out of five in difficulty. It was long, it was hot, it was hard. And I didn't have a mountain bike. So I went to the guy down the hall for me and I said, hey, can I borrow your mountain bike for the weekend? I'm going to Moab. And he said, sure. So I take this bike out in porcupine rim and I ended up tacoing the front tire, just bending it. So I had to pack out the bike for five miles and I took it to a bike shop and the bike shop says, well, we can fix it, but we don't necessarily have this rim, or we don't necessarily have this tire. And I said, yeah, yeah, just fix it. So I bring the bike back, and it looks completely different. The tires don't match, and the rims don't match. And my friend says, did you like my ride? I said, oh, it was great. <laughs> Love this mountain biking thing. And then when I was a sophomore, the people who were running that organization all graduated, and there was a void in leadership. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll put my hat in the ring to be president. So I was voted in president. And then I come to find out that the organization is broke. The organization has bills to pay back to the university. The organization is in arrears. And there is no money to pay the bills. So I got to go to the student government and explain why this debt existed or what we were going to do to get out of it. And fortunately, we were able to do that. And the organization exists today. And it continues to have strong leadership. Um, next chart. My first summer, I was a camp counselor at Camp North Star in Wisconsin, and I taught wakeboarding. So I was out on the lake all summer long, and I taught kids how to wakeboard and how to water ski, and it was a great job. For the next three years of my college career, I got a job with Sun Microsystems. So back then, Sun Microsystems was like the Google, the Facebook, the Apple. It was the place to be. So back then, Sun Microsystems had the biggest and best servers in the world. If you don't know who Sun is or was, they don't exist anymore. They created Java, Solaris, ZFS, NSF, Spark architecture. And back then, 90% of the world's internet traffic went through Sun servers. They were a big deal. And it was an exciting place to work. It was a dream job of mine. I really enjoyed it. I really loved it. And my third year there, I got my Unix system administration certification, my Unix network system administration certification. So they put me on phone support. So now I had companies calling me for tech support because their servers are down. And predominantly, these people are angry at me. And they're looking to vent, looking for me to solve the problem over the phone. And I didn't like that job <laughs> at all. It was, it was not a good job. And so they recorded everything that I said. And they had metrics on how fast I closed <laughs> tickets. And they had metrics on how many tickets I closed every day. right? And, and I got feedback on these metrics. It was a stressful job. It was not a rewarding job. And I struggled with that. The first two years were great. I finally got qualified to do something. And I found out that I didn't like it. So the next chart. I left Sun. I went to New Zealand. <laughs> I graduated. And the last semester of college, I went to my informal mentor. And I said, hey, just curious. We're all lining up job interviews. It's our last semester. 
have you got any job interviews? Have you got any offers? And he said, well, actually, man, I'm joining the Peace Corps. I said, really? A guy like you can go anywhere and do anything. You join the Peace Corps. And he said, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I said, that's fantastic, truly inspirational. And so I went home, and I was struggling because I didn't feel like I wanted to stay with some microsystems. I didn't feel like I had a good plan on what I want to do with my life. And I was interviewing with other companies, but I didn't have any offers yet. And so I pulled up Peace Corps on the website, and I applied. And the Peace Corps is a six-month application process. And I was graduating in two months. So I had at least four months to kill. I thought to myself, well, you know what? I've always wanted to hike the Milford Sound Trail, which is that Backland Trail. And that's the Rootburn Trail. So I think I'm going to go do that. So I applied for a, a four-month work visa in New Zealand. I got it. And I'd saved up some money from some microsystems. And I thought to myself, so I'm gonna just going to fly down there. I'm going to work for two months. And then I'm going to travel for two months and just backpack and climb. And so I got down there. Didn't have any plans, didn't have any reservations. This is before the day of smartphones. And I was in Auckland. Auckland's a beautiful city, but it's like any other big city. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm not sure I want to spend a whole lot of time here in Auckland. My first day in Auckland, I met a guy from Montana named Gunner. And Gunner was on the tail end of his around the world trip. And he was a rock climber. And I said, hey, there's an auction tomorrow. We should go see if we can pick up a van and go down to the South Island. I said, okay. So we go to the auction, we find this diesel van. Neither of us know anything about diesel engines. For $100, we buy the van, we take it to a dump, we use their resources and tools to build a platform so we could sleep on top and store our gear underneath, and we drive down to the South Island. We end up at a rock climbing camp, and the guy who owns the camp allegedly was a former British um, Secret Service agent quite the character, but avid rock climber. So he took us out, showed us all the routes, did a lot of climbing. Gunnar and I lived out of the van together for two months. The four months I was in New Zealand, I only stayed in the hostel for two nights. So I could stretch my dollars pretty far when I was down there. And Gunnar had to leave at two months, and I could stay because I had a work visa that I never actually used. And so I had two months myself to drive the van around, and. I had about one week left of my trip, and so I was driving back to North Island to catch my flight out of Auckland, and the van died. And luckily, I was in a town. So I go to the nearest business and say, hey, there's an auto mechanic somewhere nearby. And it's actually right down the road, there's an auto mechanic. So I push the van, the auto mechanic. The auto mechanic says, yeah, your transmission shot. It's going to be about $1,000 if you want to get it fixed. And I said, hmm, no thanks. Do you know what I can do with this van? Don't want to just leave it here in your parking lot. He says, well, actually, there's a wrecking yard down the road. OK. So I push the van down the road into the wrecking yard. And I said, hey, you want a van? I says, not really. <laughs> and I said, well, I got nothing to do with it. I'm not looking for any money out of it. I just need to put it somewhere, because I'm going to take off. And he says, OK, well, I can take it off your hands. And so I started unpacking all my stuff and putting everything in my backpack. And he says, well, where are you going to go? I said, I'm going to go to Auckland. i got a flight to catch in a week. And he says, well, how are you going to get there? I said, I don't know. I start walking. I said, well, it's an hour and a half drive away. I said, yeah, i got a week. I'll figure it out. <laughs> but he said, I'll tell you what. You work for me for a week, and I'll feed you in Iberia. So he was kind of an alcoholic. <laughs> and I said, I, I'm happy to work for you, but I'll tell you, I don't know much about mechanics. Don't know anything about diesel engines, ironically enough. I said, that's fine. I'll teach you everything you need to know. So he took me to his family. I lived with his family for a week. And at the end of the week, he drove me up to Auckland to catch my flight. I still keep in touch with that family to this day. Next chart. So I also got to go to Fiji in Australia to scuba dive the Rainbow Reef in Fiji, which is the only known breeding ground for the man-eating tiger shark. But beautiful soft coral destination. I'm glad I went when I did, because there's a lot of coral bleaching in the last decade. And so these reefs just don't look like this anymore, which is very unfortunate. So I show up in the island of Tavanui, Fiji, I want to scuba dive, and find a hotel room, find a dive charter. And we go out the next day. And I got to see a man-eating tiger shark, which was exciting. I got to see lots of lionfish, which are highly venomous. 
and they're nocturnal, so we go through these coral claves and they're sleeping upside down, and you gotta be very careful not to touch one of them, because if you brush up one, you could get poisoned. But the exciting thing about Fiji was they had all these venomous sea snakes, and they're white and black banded sea snakes that breathe air, and so they go down the coral and they do their hunting, and then they shoot straight up to get air, and then they come back down. So as you're swimming along, these long sea snakes just kind of come up out of nowhere out of the coral to go up and get air, or they come back down from having gotten a gulp of air, and they're everywhere, pervasive, highly venomous. And so I get done with the first dive, and it's warm water, so I'm not wearing a wetsuit or any kind of skin protection. And on the dive boat, they have a platform that's at the water level, so you could get onto it easily with all your dive equipment. And there's a Fijian lady whose sole purpose in life is to sweep off the sea snakes from the diving platform so you can easily get back on the platform. So that creates this big cloud of angry venomous sea snakes that you swim through to get to the boat, which fortunately enough didn't result in any harm or damage. I'll say I went to Australia and I got to dive the Great Barrier Reef and I got to do some backpacking in Australia and Australia everything is out to kill you. In, in New Zealand, there's nothing that can hurt you. There's no poisonous insects, there's no alligators lurking in the fresh water. In New Zealand, I drink water out of the streams, lakes, creeks, without even filtering it, I never got sick. In Australia, they said, last thing you want to do is go filter water because an alligator will come and snap you up and drown you. And you really don't want to go to the beach and scuba dive because there's sharks and there's venomous box jellyfish, and so you want to take a boat out to get to the reefs. You don't want to swim out there. So that's the difference between New Zealand and Australia. Next chart. So while I was in New Zealand and Fiji and Australia, I got an offer from the Peace Corps. And they wanted to send me to China for environmental education. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if I could learn Chinese and do something related to environmental education in China? And then SARS broke out. And I said, nope, can't go to China. We're going to send you to East Timor, which is half the island of Java. It's a Catholic country in a big uh, Muslim region. And I said, OK, I can do that. And I said, no, well, civil war in East Timor. We're not going to send you there. I said, OK. So they said, we'll give you a choice. You can go to Moldova or you can go to Mauritania. I hadn't heard of either country. So Mauritania is a sub-Saharan sub African country, a Muslim country, and Moldova is in Europe. So I said, how bad can Europe be? So I Googled Moldova, and I saw these images. So Moldova is nestled here between Romania and the Ukraine, former Soviet bloc country. It's a wine region, very agrarian. So the next chart, turns out Europe can be pretty poor in places. So these are my, some of my neighbors coming home from the field. I lived in Moldova for almost two and a half years. The road down here, you'll see there's a lot of mud so the roads aren't paved, and the preferred mode of transportation is horse-drawn cart. So there's a lot of animals that use these roads. So this isn't entirely just mud. And there's the house that I lived in, there was no running water, no electricity, no heat. In fact, the school didn't even have heat. It's freezing cold. This particular village is up in the mountains. It was the highest village in the country. Next chart. So here's just some of the images out of the book that I passed around. So no running water, so where the water comes, there's a communal well that you go to to get water from. And then if you want to do laundry or shower, you have to build a fire and then heat the water. And Nicole had a pretty good life. She, uh, she had this plastic basin here, and she had a sun shower up here. So you fill that up with water, and you lay it out, and it warms up in the sun. And then you had a nice little shower. And this is her fireplace right here, so you had a warm place to take a shower. And these two pictures. Um, Nicole and I volunteered in an orphanage, so there's a Baptist church that basically took over the operations of an orphanage so that the staff could go home for Christmas, and they were looking for volunteers. And so we showed up with presents, and Moshe Kachun, Santa Claus is there, the skinniest Santa Claus you'll ever meet. And so these are the kids at the orphanage that we hung out with for Christmas. Next chart. And that's my host family, the Angelutsa family, so I lived with them for two and a half years. and so. There were cities in Moldova where Peace Corps volunteers could have an apartment and modern amenities. The village I lived in didn't have any apartments, and if I tried to rent a room, I would starve because they don't have any food available when the snow came in and cut off all communications and traffic. And so they would pickle food 
which is the reason why I don't eat pickles anymore because I went months just eating pickled food alone. They would pickle everything that you can imagine, strawberries, watermelons, you name it, it can be pickled. They did have apples all year round, so apples were kept fresh, and so that's about all we got that was fresh is apples. But they took me in like I was the son they never had, and I still keep in touch with them to this day. This was Renata's birthday in this particular picture, so we're enjoying some champagne, and we got her a book, and we got her a real Barbie doll from America. Next chart. So then, milestone, I've been dating Nicole, this is my wife Nicole, for almost two years, and so we got to the point where are we gonna go back together, or are we gonna go back, her to Cincinnati and me to San Diego? which wasn't really a viable option. So a bunch of us volunteers have been training for the marathon in Athens and the 10K. And so our vacation came and we went out and I ran the marathon, which is 20 miles uphill from Marathon to Athens, and then four miles kind of low grade into the Olympic Stadium where you end. And um, we went out to dinner that night and I popped the question and luckily I had some friends that knew that I was going to pop the question, so they had their cameras ready, so I was able to capture the reaction of Nicole, who wasn't even expecting to get a ring. And then the next day, we went to the Parthenon, and I'll never forget these freaking stairs, because if the Parthenon has a lot of big marble stairs, and I was on marathon legs, and I was walking very slowly. And Nicole, who did the 10K, was up and down and up and down, giving me a hard time. And it took me all morning to get up to the Parthenon, but I made it. I took the picture, next chart. So then we were engaged and we came back to America and I had a hard time readjusting back to American life. And I thought that was interesting. And so I had called Nicole's father and asked for his blessing over the phone and said, hey, you don't know me. And this is back when making a long distance call costs a lot of money, right? So I was <laughs> trying to hurry this up. I don't have a whole lot of time to talk to you, sir. So I just want to ask you one question. <laughs> A simple yes or no will suffice. <laughs> so I got his blessing, and so I go back to San Diego, and Nicole comes with me. We're able to travel across Europe with the readjustment allowance that the Peace Corps gave us. And uh, so my parents got to meet Nicole for the first time. We're already engaged, and they take us out to a wonderful steak dinner in San Diego. And they spent a lot of money on that steak dinner, and it was a beautiful gesture, but Nicole and I were just disgusted by how much money was just spent on that meal. And we, we were in tears by the waste that was spent on that single dinner because we knew how far that money could go. And so I packed up everything that I owned, put it in my truck, drove it to Columbus, Indiana, and we planned our wedding and we got married. And so you're never ready to be married, you're never ready to be a parent, right? But when I got married, I was making minimum wage. I was a cashier at Home Depot. I was living with my in-laws, and Nicole has a very large extended family in Cincinnati, the majority of which I met for the first time on my wedding night. So there I am in the church, freshly married, and there's a procession line where everyone's shaking my hand and saying, welcome to the family. And so I get these questions like, so where are you from? Where do you live? What do you do? And hey, I work at Home Depot. I live with her <laughs> parents, <laughs> right? Oh, that's great. Welcome to the family. Glad to have you. Thanks. And, and we were broke. Right? We spent all of our money traveling Europe, didn't have anything, just getting farther and farther in debt. And um, I was waiting on Nicole to figure out where she was getting into grad school. So I wasn't actively applying for jobs. New to the state, so I didn't really have any friends in Columbus, Indiana. And it turns out that she got into IU. So we're going to Bloomington. Great. So I go up to a career fair in Indianapolis with my resume, and there's a crane booth. And I come up to one and say, hey, so I've got this thing called non-competitive eligibility. So the Peace Corps is a partner with the state, so I was a government employee. And I was honorably discharged, not literally, but that's what it is. And so you get this thing for a year called non-competitive eligibility. I didn't know how to prove it. I didn't have any paperwork behind it. And so I told the crane booth, hey, I've I've got this thing, I'm qualified, I've got an engineering degree, I've got non-competitive eligibility, but don't really know how to prove that to you. Here's my resume, and they said, great. So then I went down the line to the Department of Forestry, and I get, hey, I've got this thing called non-competitive eligibility, I'm looking for a federal government job, and I said, oh, well, here's the form you need to fill out 
to prove that you have eligibility. I said, great. So I took it, I filled it out, walked back to the crane booth. I said, can you staple this <laughs> to my resume? And I got a call back. So we moved to Bloomington, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the bottom bullet. So all of these things were humbling and embarrassing and difficult, but none of it mattered, right? Because Nicole and I were together, and we had survived Moldova, <laughs> so we knew we were going to be OK. Next chart. So here I am at Crane. So Trent Anderson hired me into this building in a GXM in the 605 at the time. And I was working classified GPS constellation simulation for SB24 navigation. Didn't know anything about GPS, right? Completely unqualified. So I figured that out. And pretty quickly, I understood that working in a classified lab by myself with no windows wasn't the greatest thrill of my life. So I talked to Jim Allen, who was a division manager at the time, about potentially other opportunities that might present themselves. And he says, hey, I need a lean core team lead. What if I bring you up to division level? And at that time, being a lean core team lead was like a death sentence. Everyone hates you. You got your tires slashed. The last thing you wanted to do is to stop by someone and say, hey, you want to be on a lean core team? So I said, Jim, I'll tell you what. I'll do it for a year, and then you can help me find out between now and then what I want to do with my life and where I want to go. And he said, deal. So a year and a half later, I'm still there. And I said, Jim, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to SB headquarters. I'm going to work for Jim Kern. I'm going to be there all summer long living in Washington, DC. And he said, great. So I went to long-term travel office. They helped me put in my travel orders. And I found an apartment that's furnished in Pentagon City. And the problem with that was that they had a minimum salary requirement, believe it or not, which I did not meet. So I called them up and said, hey, the good news is I'm coming to stay with you. The bad news is I don't meet this minimum salary requirement. The good news is I'm not going to be paying the rent the Navy is because I'm going to be on long-term travel orders. And I say, yeah, yeah, we got it. Get that all the time. Not a big deal. So I go to Phil Smith, who was a TPM at the time, and said, Phil, I got my travel orders in. Here's how much it's going to cost. I need a charge number for you. He says, OK, sure. Puts it in. So I go out to DC with Jeff Johan for an unrelated meeting back when SP was at NC2 in Crystal City. And I say, Jeff, I'm coming to work for Jim Kern this summer. And Jeff says, oh, really? Good for you. I said, I just need to meet Jim Kern and tell him that. <laughs> and he says, oh, really? OK, well, maybe we can do lunch today. So we go outside the cafeteria at NC2, and Jim Kern shows up, and I introduce myself. And I said, Mr. Kern, Brian Snow, happy to meet you. I'm coming to work for you this summer. And he says, oh, really? What are you going to be doing? And I said, well, that's why we're conducting this meeting right now. <laughs> I says, oh, really? I said, Jim, I don't know what I can do for you, but I'll tell you what. I will give you my 100% effort, and I can guarantee you that I'll work hard for it. And he said, well, actually, I've got this problem. The problem's called refresh space. And if you could go wrap your arms around that, then it would help me out. So I got my first program management assignment. Never been a program manager before. Completely unqualified, but that's OK. Next chart. So there I was as an intern SSP working refresh phase. So that's shore base acceptance checkout equipment. So that is the piece of support equipment that DD-250 is the Trident 2D5 missile. So it simulates a flight profile on the missile and records all the responses of the missile. And, and we were refreshing that piece of equipment. So I got to learn about how the missile works in intimate detail. And then they rewarded me with the opportunity to go renovate Building 3188 when they set up the attachment. I said, I don't know anything about IT requirements, government facility requirements, I'm completely unqualified. That's OK. You'll figure it out. And then they rewarded me with missile inverter qualification, right? <laughs> and I said, guys, I have never worked production in my life. If you look at production requirements for the Trident 2D5 program, they are significant. You need an expert. That's OK. You'll be fine. So then we had this flight test iteration called DASO 25 coming up. And it was the first time that SP was going to fly the LE flight controls and airlocks package. And it was looking like they were going to be significantly late. And so, well, we need a flight test lead to go be the full-time job to go figure out how we're going to get back on track and back on schedule. And so they gave it to me. And I said, guys, I, 
I don't know anything about flight test operations, right? So we had to coordinate facilities, we had to coordinate development, we had to coordinate production, we had to coordinate with the Air Force, who's the range. We had to coordinate with a lot of other technical branches for all the paperwork that had to be in place to get this flight test iteration off the ground. And it worked. We got off on time, luckily. And then we had a D-Link problem investigation. So there was a problem with sync between the guidance subsystem and the test missile kit system. And it had occurred twice. And two investigations had gone by, and nobody could figure it out. So it happened the third time. And the Admiral says, no kidding. We're going to do a problem investigation this time. All hands on deck. We're going to go figure this out. Great. So next thing you know, Jim gives it to me. I've got 13 organizations on this IPT. And if that's not bad enough, Admiral Bennett decides that he's going to get a retired admiral to come oversee the IPT and issue him a report on how the IPT is functioning and whether or not our conclusions are valid. So here I am as an IPT lead, knowing that there's a retired admiral breathing down my neck, going to issue a report on how I'm doing my job. That was a stressful time. And so I went into Jim Kern's office, my supervisor, and I said, Jim, I am stressed out. I'm tired. I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared this report's going to come out, and it's going to be embarrassing for you. It's going to be embarrassing for the organization. I don't know what to tell you. And Jim looks at me and he says, you know what? You're saying all the right things, and you're in the right place. Because I would rather try to pull you back than try to whip you forward. And so if you're out of your comfort zone, that's OK. And if you don't understand what's going on, that's OK. Because there's been two investigations prior. No one else understands what's going on. So that's what everyone's doing. <laughs> Go figure it out. <laughs> All right. So we figured it out. And then I got a call from Becky Clark. I was down in Cape Canaveral, Florida. And it was a Thursday night. I was in my hotel room. And Becky Clark says, hey, Brian, are you going to the uh, program review next week? And I said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she says, great. What would be? Perfect is if you could just put together an IMP IMS for LE2 and bring it to the program review and present it. I said, great. So just send me what you got on that, and I'll polish it up. And she says, no, it doesn't exist. Here's the problem. We need to start from a system engineering framework, right? So just give me some dates on when we're going to have the system CDR, the PDR, the SRR, and we'll go tell everyone to go figure out the details. And so I've got till Tuesday to go put together an IMP and IMS for LE2. So I show up, and I'm on the agenda, and I'm presenting to Lockheed Martin Vice President and Commander um, Doug Williams at the time. This is our plan for LE2. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> and Lockheed just jumps all over me. Well, where did this plan come from? What are all the ground rules and assumptions? Who gives you the right to plan LA2? <laughs> all great questions. So let's, let me address those one by one. <laughs> and then they gave me the CMC budget executor assignment. So luckily, we had Dave Beckett, who's retired now, um, to help me with this. But Basically, it's planning the integration of the strategic weapon system on the Columbia class boat over 500 billion from when I got the budget package to when the weapon system is fully integrated. So, how do you plan out 500 billion in minute detail to where the board of directors would be comfortable with it? Daunting task. And to make matters worse, the previous a lieutenant had the assignment had presented it, got a whole lot of action items from the board to go fix, and left, and got deployed, and is now out of pocket, so I can't even talk to her. And I inherited this budget package, and I spent a lot of long hours trying to figure out how to make sense of it and to anticipate what the board of directors were going to ask me when I got there. Next question, or next slide. And then ironically enough, it was my daughter's fourth birthday, and I was in Washington, DC which is OK by me, because we were going to celebrate over the weekend and have a birthday party for her. But I'm on the phone with her, wishing her happy birthday, and she asked me why I'm not there. I said, well, sweetheart, I'll be there this weekend. We'll celebrate. We'll have cake. We'll have presents. We'll have a party. It'll be fun. She's like, but yeah, but why aren't you here today? Because it's my birthday. So I didn't have a good answer for her. And I don't know if there is a good answer for that. But I thought to myself when I got off the phone that I've been on the road every other week 
fairly religiously. And so she's four today, and I probably missed half of it. Probably wasn't there for half of it. And I finally got to the point where I felt like I was qualified to do my job. I was good at my job. I had a bright future with SSP. But now I'm at the point where I don't know that that's what I want to do. So I reached out to Phil Smith, and I reached out to Ben Harkness, and I said, I've got no complaints other than I'm traveling too much. And I could travel less, but I can't do the job if I travel less. I can stay at home. It's not like my boss is making me go on travel, kicking me out the door, but I can't do the job if I don't do the travel. So long story short, I got a position on Ben's staff as a system engineer. And my first assignment was, hey, Brian, why don't you go explain to SP's admiral how we're going to save 10%. So that made me really popular coming back to Cray and say, OK, guys, we're going to save 10%. So I got to meet with Mike Magich every month to talk about efficiencies. And then I worked really hard trying to get qualified for this SPCA job for about a year and a half. And I knew that if I stayed in the detachment, I wouldn't be qualified for the SPCA job. I probably wouldn't even make the cert to get the interview. I needed to come back to Crane to have a shot at getting this job. And so I did. And I prepared for that interview. I read the instruction that Crane has on how to conduct interviews. I talked to people who have been on interview panels. I talked to people who have been through interview panels. And I was about as prepared as I could be. And I was competing against people with more experience than me. I was competing against people who were more qualified than me. I was competing against people who had more experience in the program than me. And I was nervous because if I didn't get this job, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life or what I wanted to be when I grew up. So fortunately, I got the job, and here I am, and life is good. And one of the first questions I get asked is, so what are you going to do next? I said, well, I just got my dream job. What do you mean, what am I going to do next? There is no next. This is the pinnacle of my career. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> I've made it, right? So I honestly don't know what I'm going to do next. I haven't thought that far ahead. I'm still trying to be a CA, try to get my qualifications for the job that I have, trying to do a good job. I have some road ahead of me to get there. But I'm not going to let that stop me. So the next chart, just to summarize, programs is plural, people. So whenever you spot <laughs> SSP, it's strategic systems programs. Please don't forget that. And then I will, I use the words lean in here intentionally because Rachel and I are co-leading a lean in circle later today. And so I don't offer that just in the spirit of empowering women, but I would offer that to lean in in the sense of go ahead and take those risks, right? Don't wait for someone, quote unquote, more qualified to come along and take that assignment. Go ahead and take those risks. Give it a shot. See what you can do. And, and my experience has been that if you conduct yourself honestly and professionally and don't do anything unethical, even if you're out there on the hairy edge and you're the stupidest guy in the room and you don't understand what's going on, you're still going to be able to provide value and you're going to learn from that experience and it'll make you a better person going forward. So don't let fear drive your actions. See how you can lean in. See how you can try to get outside your comfort zone and take those assignments that scare you and help others do the same. And then when I went through the LDI, I got rated really low on Encourage the Heart. I got dinged on that pretty hard. And so I make a conscious effort to try to do better at Encouraging the Heart ever since I took the LDI and got that feedback. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to write thank you cards. And so I have a thank you card today for Mary Beth, who's put on this series. So I want to thank you for all your efforts and filling this into your busy schedule. Thank you, Mary Beth. So that's all I have. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening.